Okay, um, so next week I'll be traveling for the whole week. We have lectures pre-recorded. There is one more lecture related to uh, hidden Markov model that uh, probably uh, we'll just ask you guys to watch it. We, we recorded this, uh, but that will conclude the whole uh, second module on gene regulation. So let's look at what we have learned in this class. Um, we have learned about transcription factor motif finding. Right, so there are some known motifs databases, uh, such as Jasper, Homer, Factor Book, and Hokomoko. These are kind of like just known motifs. Um, you can also look at a de novo motif finding, and, and you can represent the motif either by a regular expression, or you can do uh, represent a motif with a probability weight matrix. Most of the time, people use weight matrix to represent a motif, and they use sequence logo to show the, the motif uh, patterns. And we talk about using expectation maximization and give sampler approaches to identify those motifs. And uh, later on, people also look at evolutionary conservation and look at motif modules, which mean many, many transcription factors bind in a short, say, one to 200 base pair region. That's kind of a concentrated region where uh, transcription factor binding sites happen. They try to use this to improve the signal to noise. Um, but really what you know, is helping quite a bit uh, now is uh, transcription factor chip seek. Um, and so uh, once you have chip seek, motif finding becomes much easier. Uh, so we discuss using uh, max for motif uh, for, for chip seek peak calling. And for chip seek, quality control is always a big issue. I would say most of the time RNA seek works, but still a significant portion of chip seek data published in even high profile journals are of pretty bad quality. So definitely do make sure you do quality control. So PBC measures how much PCR amplification bias you have. Uh, we wanna make sure that uh, we have a FDR when we call the peaks. Um, and also we wanna look at how many peaks we have a good you know, fold change because sometimes when you sequence very deep, a lot of peaks show up, they are not very good. So you need to have some kind of fold change. Um, there's also uh, the fraction of reads in the peaks, which tell us you know, how strong is the signal to noise, whether the peaks really overlap with the, all the DNA's hypersensitivity peaks because DNA's pretty much is the whole repertoire of transcription factor binding. And so if you have a chip seek of one transcription factor, you want to overlap with the union of all the DNA's peaks. I would say a good chip seek data should have probably 80 to 90% of those binding sites within a, a previously known DNA sites now. You can also look at the evolutionary conservation pattern of the, the, the chip seek data and see whether the motif is enriched in the peaks uh, for the transcription factor you're interested in. Um, and then, um, in order to see what this, trans you know, very often you do chip seek of one transcription factor, we want to see what is this chip seek interacting with. And you will see from homework four, in order to do this, there are two ways you can do it. One is you, you use this chip seek data, you pull other published chip seek to see what other transcription factor bindings have significant overlap of binding sites with your factor of interest. And uh, in homework four, you can try the uh, Systrom toolkit. It will tell you in you know, which other ChIP-seq data has significant overlap. Or uh, you can just look at transcription factor motifs, look at the motif enrichment in uh, the ChIP-seq data. So supposedly you are doing factor A ChIP-seq, but then when you do motif analysis, not only you found the motif A, you also found motif B and C and D. Maybe those B and C and D are interacting factors with your, with your factor of interest, right? Um, and then um, in order to figure out this transcription factors target gene, um, we, we use this regulatory potential, which is you know, how many binding sites are near this transcription factor, or, or, sorry, are near each gene, and we weigh them by the distance from the binding to the gene with some decay distance. And, and very often we also have, it would be great if you also have differential expression uh, between when the factor is active and when the factor is inactive. It could be like a stimulation to activate the factor, or you can knock down or knock out the factor you're interested in and look at the differential expression. And very often if you have the chip seek data as well as the differential expression, 
it will give you much better target, right? You can use it to see whether the factor activates gene expression or repress gene expression. You can also combine the binding and differential expression to get the target genes. Then you can use gene set enrichment or gene ontology to figure out the biological function or, or, or processes involved. Okay, um, and then um, this is more transcription factor chip seek. Then we started talking about epigenetics because basically we know that the transcription factor is supposed to bind because of DNA sequence motif, but then when you do chip seek of the same transcription factor in different cells, very often you found that they, they actually bind to quite different locations. For the same transcription factor, if you do them in different cells, very often their, their peak overlap is only like maybe a third or a half. You will still find the correct motif for the TF itself, but it could be that the collaborating factor is different. Maybe in one cell, factor A is interacting with B and C, but in another cell, factor A is interacting with E and F. Then they go to different sites, okay? Yeah, so uh, because of that, people started uh, to be interested in epigenetics. Uh, the first thing, you know, early day, people are very interested in DNA methylation and, de and demethylation. Uh, so DNA methylation, uh, so, so the, the, the key is, you know, like for DNA methylation, we talk about bisulfide sequencing. And because bisulfide sequencing converted the, the, the C to a T, in the read mapping stage, we need to make sure we map both the C and the T. Uh, Right? And based on the CT percentage, we will know the percentage of methylated versus unmethylated uh, C in that location. And uh, for DNA methylation in one particular cell, it's usually zero or one. It's either all methylated or all unmethylated. And very often, if you have one CG and a nearby CG uh, within, say, a, a couple hundred bases away, they usually have correlated DNA methylation patterns. So because DNA methylation enzyme, they actually um, they spread the signals. And so what is the function of uh, DNA methylation? Um, so uh, interestingly, it has um, many different functions. There are many, many repeats in the genome. In fact, the half of the human genome are repetitive sequences. And in there, DNA methylation mostly is just to cover this region up, make them inactive. Right, so their DNA methylation mostly have silencing effect. Um, and then at the beginning of a gene in the promoter region, there's usually a small region that's very heavily CG rich. It's called the CPG island. And that region, if it's DNA methylated, then the gene is locked up. The, G, the, the, the nearby gene cannot be turned on. But if the promoter CPG is not methylated, the gene will has a potential to be turned on, but whether it turns out or not depends on whether the transcription factor is binding nearby. Once the gene is turned on, interestingly, the gene, the gene body axons can get methylated, and there are studies showing that methylation on the gene body helps to promote the expression of, the, of that gene. And recently, people are also finding that enhancers can have DNA methylation. Um, some transcription factors really cannot find methylated DNA. If DNA methylation is on the enhancer, some transcription factors just don't go there. Interestingly, some other transcription factors can prefer to bind to methylated DNA. And, and then once they go there, they kind of try to remove the DNA methylation to allow other transcription factors to bind there. And so DNA methylation in enhancers also is very interesting. And um, uh, there is a lot of studies showing DNA methylation misregulation in the disease. And in the next module, we definitely see DNA methylation to be heavily involved in cancer uh, gene regulation. Uh, next aspect of uh, epigenetics is uh, nucleosome positioning. Uh, so, so we know like the nucleosomes on the genome are like pearl necklaces. They help to package the genome into more compact structures. Some regions are kind of more open, other regions are, are more compact. So the very basic unit of chromatin compaction is nucleosome. Uh, it's 146 nucleotides wrapped around eight histone proteins to form that little pearl, right? It's like a pearl necklace. Um, and very often this prevent transcription factor from binding. So very often for transcription factor to bind to a region, they either go to the region in between the, the two nucleosomes or some transcription factors can go there and squeeze out the nucleosome. 
Okay, so those, uh, those are usually called pioneering factors. They can go there, they can remove DNA methylation, they can remove the, the histones, and they open up the region for some other transcription factors to bind there. Okay, um, yeah, and in terms of nucleus of positioning, you know, we can now also do high throughput sequencing to get it, and uh, there are two levels of positioning that we mentioned. One is this uh, rotational positioning, because uh, DNA has 10 base pair periodicity for GC-rich versus AT-rich, because, you know, like, uh, the, the, the nucleosome, because there are two turns of the nucleosome, it likes to make sure all the CGs are facing the inside histones and ATs are facing outside. So, the, you know, like when you are a little bit off, it may not be very happy. But then the, the more important thing is the statistical positioning. When the transcription factor goes in, it squeeze out the, the nucleosome. It helps to position the, the flanking nucleosomes to be in better position. And that positioning actually gives us hints what is happening in the in this location, whether the transcription factor is binding strongly or not. Um, and then we talk about the histone modification. So there are many, many different type of histone modifications, right? Uh, there's a hypothesis for histone code, which I think people are gradually seeing it's really happening. Um, depending on the different histone mark, different enrichment, it has a different function. Different histone marks are enriched in different locations, you know, some activate gene expression, some a repressed gene expression, some attract a transcription factor binding, some prevent transcription factor binding. And there are many, many enzymes that uh, read, or write, or erase the DNA uh, modifications or the histone modifications. Uh, so histone modification, um, very often uh, transcription factors can attract those reader, writers, and erasers of histone marks. And basically, um, you can imagine these histone marks as kind of a little flags in the genome to help attract the transcription factors or, or prevent transcription factors from going there. Okay, because the human genome is too big. Your bacteria genome didn't really have histone modification because the genome is so small. When you have the transcription factor, it just tests every site. But human genome is too big. So DNA methylation and also histone modification are landmarks to help transcription factor find its place faster and faster as the cell you know differentiate knows its identity so next round every cell know like what transcription factor will know where they should go yeah so um, you can use uh, those histone mark chip seek uh, to help us identify important uh, events for example you can use histone mark to identify new genes, you know, novel genes in the genome, like non-coding genes. You can use it to identify, uh, so those bivalent genes turns out to be very important because you want to make sure their expression is tightly regulated. Both the active and inactive marks need to be there to be balanced so you can have a good regulation. And also the super promoter or the super enhancer genes are those genes that have very, very strong cell type, specific, cell type specific essential functions. And so you want, basically, um, it's like when you want the door to be open, you have a door stopper to really, you know, histone mark is there to kind of make, keep the door open so all the transcriptional events can happen. So uh, all the histone mark is helping the transcription factors to do its job in some sense. Um, it can also identify, like in, in many cases, when you don't have a, uh, you don't know what transcription factor is important, you can use histomark chipseq to identify the key transcription factors that is involved in the process. You can also use it to annotate the genome. Based on the histomark, you know, okay, this is enhancer, this is a promoter, this is, you know, introns or repetitive sequence in the genome. Uh, and then we talk about uh, chromatin accessibility. Um, so there are two assays. One is DNA-seq and the other is a tech-seq. DNA-seq has a very, very sharp signal. It gives you high resolution of where that transcription factor binds. A tech-seq is very easy to do. Even for cells that you can't do uh, chip-seq, you can do a tech-seq. In fact, uh, now there are commercial solutions for single-cell attack-seq. You can even do attack-seq in every individual cells. And uh, so it's a very good like the signal is not as sharp as DNAs, but it gives you very, very informative signals already. Um, it's a way of, for high resolution mapping of all the transcription factor binding sites. Um, and then uh, in the lecture that you, you guys should 
have watched a video, just be very careful about the footprinting when you have very high res, like a, uh, if you look at the peaks, DNA's peak is usually like 100, 200 base pair. That's actually a good resolution. When you really try to look at the footprint in like five to 10 base pair region, you need to be careful whether that footprint is real or just cutting bias of the enzyme, okay? Um, and, but then basically, DNAs and ataxic kind of give us all the binding sites of a, a particular cell condition. And then we talk about higher order chromatin interaction. Uh, there's high C experiment recently. There are also like high chip or plaque seek in a similar experiment. Basically, try to look at the chromatin uh, interactions. And uh, from high C, we see different level of interactions. At the very low level, you see some loops. One region of the genome is looping to another region, right? And then uh, when we zoom out, we see some TADs. Some regions um, have like, uh, uh, low, like uh, I would say less interaction or at least the interaction have a longer range. Some other regions have uh, more, um, or uh, basically uh, uh, there, there are a lot of these compartments where interaction happen within the TAD, but they don't happen across different TADs. So where the interactions are or kind of in, 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 in regions or domains. And finally, there are compartments. Uh, these are also kind of interesting. If you look at the nucleus, the compartment A is usually on the outside. They are usually the heterochromatin, very silent regions. But inside is the compartment, sorry, inside is, sorry, outside is compartment B is the silent region or heterochromatin regions. Whereas inside is compartment A, these are the mostly active transcribed region, like housekeeping genes are, are usually in the middle. And so with high C experiment, you could tell you know, from the very uh, detailed looping to the very high level of chromatin compartmentalization. And all these interactions, uh, at least for the loops, people found that, um, so CTCF seemed to be a motor it just kind of uh, move things through. And then once they see a CTCF site, they get stuck. And then you have a loop. And this could actually be a, a TAD domain. So a lot of interactions happening in the, sorry, maybe I'll show it here. So CTCF, sorry, the cohesin is like the motor that moves things around. But once they see a CTCF site, they get stuck. And everything in the middle form a TAD. These are the things that interact with each other a lot more. And so the loop extrusion model actually under, like a, it, it, it was very interesting. It was a computation uh, and the data together really interpreting this model, which nowadays people believe is kind of important to form these TADs. Um, and then we briefly explain gene regulatory network, which is how come you have different modes of gene regulation. You know, when you have a feed forward loop or some uh, different models, um, how, you know, human genome, we didn't have more genes. We have slightly more, more genes, but we have a much more uh, fine tuned gene regulation is because of these net network motifs. And you can, you can regulate genes in different modes. Okay, then uh, next about, uh, is about uh, GWAS and also how to interpret GWAS. So here, as I mentioned, it could be a whole course. So we did, you know, like a, just an overview. There are many SNPs in the genome. And some of these uh, SNPs have uh, link, link, uh, linkage disequilibrium with each other. And all those LD SNPs form a haplotype. So it's a block. They always get transmitted together. And so um, there are these uh, genome-wide association studies now, um, some based on family-based studies, looking at the two parents and one affected child, or you just look at people with the disease versus people without the disease, and you, you ask whether their SNPs are different. Uh, it's just a lot of chi-square tests, and you, you want to see who, you know, whether there's a difference. Um, and so a lot of these studies, uh, initially don't have power, but now as people are doing more of, uh, of these studies, they realize uh, there are some important factors that improve the performance of these uh, association studies. One is sample size. You need a very big number of patients, um, especially for those diseases that have a small effect size or the, those uh, uh, SNPs. Uh, so yeah, so you need big cohorts, but when you have a big cohort, make sure there's no population stratification. So the case and control need to have 
you know, similar populations comparable, then you, you, can, you can look at the difference. And also within that population, make sure you don't have like uh, twins or siblings or, or cousins that are too close, right? To just remove potential uh, artifacts. And, and assuming that you have done the GWAS analysis correctly, you end up with 50 or 100 or, or maybe three strong GWAS SNPs, then how do you interpret this? Uh, people are using uh, EQTLs, you know, like they ask for this particular SNP, is it known to be linked to a nearby gene expression? But uh, that's in the early days. Now people are also using histone marks and uh, DNA signals to ask, when you have a SNP, does that SNP change the ChIP-seq signal in that location or the nearby uh, gene expression? Right, and, um, and yeah, so they found most of the GWAS SNPs turn out to be related to transcription factor binding. And this could uh, mean a cis EQTL, which only regulates the expression of a nearby gene, or it could be a trans EQTL, which means it regulates a nearby gene, and that gene might have an effect of a downstream thing, especially if this, 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 uh, the, the cis EQTL target gene is a transcription factor, then they will have a lot of downstream effect. Um, and in order to really understand what's the downstream effect you, uh, of a, a particular uh, SNP, you can use chromatin interactions or you can just use ChIP-seq binding um, to, to help. Okay, um, and then um, you will see uh, next Tuesday in the, in the lecture, uh, hidden Markov models it, uh, it has many different applications. Um, you could use it to identify regions of interest, like uh, that's amplified. You can use it to annotate the human genome. Uh, Here, the Markov model has been used for gene prediction, uh, protein structure prediction, and many other applications. Uh, so in, in this, we talk about what is uh, independent and uh, identically distributed uh, the distribution, and what is the Markov, you know, where things, one event influence the next event. Um, in order to understand the hidden Markov model, we, we know there are observations, but there are also hidden states. And there are three different probabilities you need to understand. One is the initial probability, one is the transition probability, one is the emission probability. And there are three different problems we try to understand. One is given the parameter of, so these are, you know, these probabilities are the parameters of a hidden Markov model. One is uh, if you are given the, uh, the given the probability, the, the parameters already, what is the likelihood of seeing a particular string of observation? And we talk about the forward and the backward procedure. Uh, for most people who are using hidden Markov model, they are mostly interested in the second type, which is um, if you have the parameters, can we guess what is the current state? The current state could be a protein structure, could be a, a genome annotation, could be, yeah, like a gene versus non-gene prediction and things like that. And for that, we use the forward backward algorithm or the Viterbi algorithm. And these two algorithms give you similar but not necessarily identical solutions and you will see why. So homework five, we actually have a question. You are gonna try to do this and you will understand how it works. Um, sometimes you may not have the parameters in a hidden Markov model and there are some heuristics that you can use to get to, to those parameters. Okay, so that's the, all the things that we covered in this lecture, I mean, in the second module. So 